Hello, my friend, Pastor Kurt here from Bayside Church down in Northern California. I'm so glad to be at Village Church teaching on Psalms today. You might remember, I I came one other time and and taught on prayer, and Mark's asked me back, and I'm really excited about this series, and I'm excited about the psalm that we're gonna study today, Psalm 34. If you got a Bible, you can turn there. This psalm is amazing because it does something for us, the reader, the learner, that a lot of passages in the Bible don't do. It gives us context. See, it's very, very important whenever you study the Bible to understand the context. Who wrote it? Why did they read it? What was the occasion that they wrote it? And this is actually the context of David at the beginning of his fugitive period. These are David's fugitive declarations. This is David actually uh, writing this incredible song when he's on the run. Well, explain this to me, Kurt. Here's the context. We know it exactly from the psalm itself. It says, of David, when he pretended to be insane uh, before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he left. Okay, so what in the world is going on here? Um, There's this song, this hit song, and the song goes something like, hey, Saul used to be a really good warrior, but now David is way better than him, and this thing is a hit. It's going all over Israel. Everyone's singing about David and how Saul is kind of the has-been, and David is the new cool guy. He's the new kids on the block for Shirley. And this thing, man, it's got a dance grace to it. It's got merchandise. It's gone TikTok famous. I mean, this song is blowing up, and it drives Saul absolutely nut, who's Saul. He's the king, the current king of Israel, and he gets so crazy nuts, he goes to try to kill David and his buddies. So David and his buddies, they take off. They're like, we're going to have none of this. And they go to this priest friend of his, and when they find the priest, the priest is like, hey, the song's here too. You got to leave. So they grab Goliath. Remember him? They grab his sword, and because the song has gotten all the way to the priest, they run to the Philistines. Okay, they go out of Israel, into Philistine territory, and they think, Saul's not going to pursue us here. No one knows about this hit song of Saul's the has-been, David's the great guy. So we're going to the Philistine. Well, they get there. Guess what? First guy that sees him. You know that David and Saul song? That's the David in the David and Saul song. You know the big summer hit? That guy, that's the platinum record. That's the David in this song. And so the Philistines are starting to go, oh my gosh, this is the guy. And David's like, this is going to get us in trouble. I'm going to get killed. My guys are going to get killed. So he acts crazy. I know you can't make this stuff up. And he gets kicked out of the Philistine king's palace and he goes, hides in a cave. He gets better. He gets to the cave and everyone who's got a bad credit score, but really good at fighting has shown up at the cave. David is gone. He's gone K-pop. I mean, he's so popular right now. He can't, he can't hide anywhere, not in the enemy's camp, not in a cave. And this whole group show up. They're like, David, we'll fight for you. By the way, we love the song. And we're on your side. And so what does David do? He's trying to hide. He's trying to be a fugitive. He's trying to get away. What does he do? He, he does the one thing that I would never do. He writes another song. David says, listen, I'm tired of this David versus Saul song. My life isn't about David versus Saul. This David versus Saul thing has gotten me into tons of trouble. I'm sick and tired of that dance craze. I'm sick and tired of that TikTok. I'm going to write the real song that should be the real hit. And he writes it. And this thing blows up. It's Psalm 34. This thing becomes the greatest hit in the history of hits. It's so big. I mean, it's bigger than Savage Love. It's bigger than Breaking Me. It's bigger than Roses. It's bigger than Mama Sita. Oh, wait. I'm talking to Christians. You guys don't know any of those songs, do you? Um, It's bigger than you're a good, good father. It's bigger than oceans. It's, 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 It's bigger than the blessing. It's bigger than graves into gardens. I mean, it's, it's, It's huge. So big is this hit. So big is this psalm that literally thousands of generations of people have studied its meaning. In a cave, as a fugitive, on the run, in great trial and chaos, David says some things about God, where he can be found, and how you and I should respond to him that change the game. What is the hit? 
What did he say? Well, let's go ahead and just get right into it. I'm gonna read verse by verse all the way through the whole psalm. I'm gonna stop two or three times, let you know a couple of things about the context and kind of what David is doing in the middle of this psalm. And then we're gonna draw out three giant principles. Don't leave, don't you dare leave. Now they're telling me on the interweb of Experts are telling me that some of you watch only part of the sermon. Don't do that. All the way through all the verses to the big application of the band. Here we go. Part one. If you're taking notes, I hope you are. Write this down. Worshiping God. He starts with worshiping God. Part one. Verse one. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lip. Extol means to bow down. He's starting with humility. I will kneel before God, he says. I'll make my heart right before my creator. Number two, I will glory. This is to brag, to hype, to celebrate in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and let them rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Now, I will glory in the Lord and glorify the Lord with me are two different words there. Very similar, related, but they're different words. And what glory means is I'll make him high. I will actually be loud about this. This is not a shy praise. This is not a, a, an internal praise. This is not a gentle little hands going up before the Lord. This is David saying, no one's gonna stop me from expressing how I feel about my God and what he's done. Glory the Lord with me. Let us exalt, lift up his name together. Why? Why extol, why glory, why glorify, why exalt? Verse four tells us, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. David's saying that it's amazing how much access he has to the God of the universe. David is saying that he cannot believe how committed God is to him. David is saying, me, lowly David, I'm not impressed with a hit song about me. I'm not impressed with people are saying about my warrior reputation. I'm impressed that God would have anything to do with me, let alone answer my prayers and soothe my fears. You know, you become a worshiper, you get to understand who God is. It's not just reciting songs or saying things. It's about understanding who he is. And when you understand who God is, you won't help but become a worshiper. You know, um, people always say, my religion is a private thing between you and me. That's not how David felt. <laughs> David said, I'm gonna praise him. I'm gonna lift him up. I'm gonna hype him up. I'm gonna tell you who he is. And I'm gonna invite you to join me. You ever seen a kid in the store that just sings and they don't care who's listening? We're in the store and I am having a good day with my mom. And they're just singing and something along the way, they get a little adolescent and they get some self-consciousness and they stop actually having that joy. David keeps the joy and he's unashamed about it. He's childlike, he's audacious, he's passionate. And then he switches. He goes from Buddy the Elf, just singing out loud for anyone to hear, to part two, seeking God. Verse five, those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. The poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of his troubles. It's not just me, David. It's everyone who humbles themselves. God will give this access. Verse seven, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Okay, let's stop here for a second. You ever wondered where the doctrine of guardian angels came from? That verse right there. Okay, so this is kind of a side sermon, little mini sermon. Uh, let's talk guardian angels. Uh, first of all, when you're in the genre of the Psalms or any of the poetry in the Bible, do not um, make whole doctrines out of any phrase or one verse. That's, that's generally a really great rule for every verse in the Bible, but it's especially true for the genre of poetry because the poetry genre is meant to inspire and lift and teach us kind of big picture things. And there's a lot of metaphor in there as it does that. So if we're gonna actually pull verses out of Psalms and make doctrines out of them, one of the doctrines we have to make is that it's sometimes God is a female chicken because the psalmist says that he takes us under his wings like a mother hen. So it's just not the right way to look at this type of genre. And plus, you don't need a guardian angel. Is there angels? Yes. Does God send angels to 
spiritually fight for us, and I don't understand it all, but, but yes, there seems to be passages where it talks about this. But you don't need some angel assigned you at birth named Ned. There's no Ned hanging over your shoulder and helping you sleep at night and making sure you cross the road. That's goofiness. The reason you don't need Ned the angel, you have Jesus, the deity, <laughs> the God. You have the Holy Spirit living in you. You have the Father. You have the triune God at your acts. This is what this whole psalm's about. David's going, I don't care how much Saul persecutes me. I don't care how troubled my life is. God's on my side and near me. And when I ask him, he responds. You don't need Ned the angel. You got God. Okay, side sermon over. Let's keep going. Um, verse eight. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people. For those who fear him lack nothing. Fear, of course, meaning a deep awe, but it also just means be afraid. Like it's mostly this word just used in the Bible for be afraid. And there is a part of a deep respect for God that is, that is fearful, that is saying, God, your ways are higher than mine and you are loving, forgiving and grace-filled, but you are also just and holy and uncompromising in your justice. Verse 10, the lions. What is, what is the metaphor here? It's uh, proud people, strong people. The lions may grow weak and hungry. Even strong people run into troubles. But those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Okay, so he starts with praise. I'm gonna humble and hype up God. Humble myself and hype up God. Then he goes, let's all seek God. Because if you seek him, you can find him the way I found him. And then he goes into teaching, exhorting about living for God. Part three, living for God. Uh, verse 11, come my children, listen to me. I will teach you to fear the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. In the Hebrew, this actually says, stop making stupid Twitter comments. Um, in the Hebrew, it kind of says, Facebook is useless to change people's opinion. I mean, we're at a place right now, and by the way, can I just say something to y'all? I apologize for America. <laughs> I mean, we, we are having a dialogue down here that, uh, I just pray for us. We need to have a revelation of civility and calmness and diplomacy and tact and intelligence and Sometimes just not saying anything in our words. All right, I'm gonna keep going because that's it's too discouraging. Um, watch your tongue. Verse 14, turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. To blot out their name from the earth, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condoned. Uh, condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. What is David saying here? There's, there's, there's a lot of ideas in here. This is why it's a great hit. It has a lot of appeal. But there's three big themes, three big applications. David gets in a cave and he says, I'm gonna change the narrative from David versus Saul, that hit song, to what David is declaring about God and our response to this God. What are David's fugitive declarations? Three, they're simple, but they're profound, and they have wide-ranging application in our life today. Here's the first one. I will praise God passionately and publicly. David is saying, worship is not a private, little, quiet thing that I do. That our God, once you know him and how responsive he is and how good he is and how he rescues and listens to the lowly should be praised publicly, earnestly, passionately, enthusiastically, and persistently. Now, now here's the thing. Um, can I make a confession to you? I've become kind of a, a weather wimp. 
I grew up in Eastern Washington state. It was cold, it was freezing, it was below zero. I mean, it was ice nine months out of the year. You gotta put the snow tires on, you gotta plug your car in. And I used to actually be able to go out in that weather and be fine and it didn't bother me at all. Then I moved to California, Northern California especially. It is so beautiful down here, people. It is perfect weather all the time. Every once in a while, we'll get a little mist of a rain and Californians shut down everything, run into their houses, there's car accidents, cats and dogs living together. I mean, it's the second there's any weather here, people start freaking out. We have people wearing parkas in September here. Now listen, I've become the, a weather wimp. The second we get a little weather here in Northern California, I've got three sweatshirts on and I got the heat cranked up in my house and build a fire. Here's what I think has happened in the middle of all the COVID. Some of us, many of us, have become worship wimps. We're so used to worship being provided for us. The band puts all the music together. The production team puts all the uh, worship together. Everything is spelled out. We got lyrics on the screen. We've got, and the lyrics are simplified. And we've got makes, and, and, and there's auto tune. And you know, we have become worship wimps. We, we're like, I can't worship because they've canceled church and now I'm on my couch and my kids are there with me. We've got to actually get tougher. I'm sorry that we're not having church as normal, but God is still worthy to be worshiped. Is, is just a little digital disruption all it takes to get the church to stop worshiping? My friend, I want you to start meditating on who God is, what he's done, how available he is, and I want you to lean in to worship. I will extol the Lord at all times. I will extol the Lord at all times. Now is the time when we need to humble ourselves and lift God up. Glorify the Lord with me. Now is the time we need to do it and do it as one church. Who am I lifting up? Who are you worshiping? You know, oftentimes what we're really worshiping is comfort and convenience. There are idols. And sometimes we're worshiping multiple gods, comfort, convenience, success, identity, and our self. I want this to be good for me. Maybe God is actually doing something profoundly uncomfortable so that people will seek him. Maybe, I've been to a lot of prayer meetings. You've been to a lot of prayer meetings? At these prayer meetings, Christians pray things like this. God, bring revival, send revival. And by that we mean, let our church numbers really, really grow so we look good in Christian publications like Outreach Magazine. Maybe when we pray, God, bring revival, what he hears is, let the culture get so disrupted that people consider the gospel. Maybe you and I praying for revival is partly what's going on here. Maybe now is the time to lean in and lift God up and worship him alone. Okay, number one theme of David, I will praise God passionately and publicly. Number two, I will trust God to protect me. I'll let God be my defender. I'm not gonna worry about Saul. I'm not gonna worry about the Philistines. I'm going to let God be my protector. I was on a board once and um, the head of my board uh, this was for all of our missionaries that I was over when I was working with college students and I was a missionary to secular university campuses. Uh, the head of the board, a great mentor of mine, very wise man, very much senior in, uh, in the ministry from me. And he and I got along really, really well until we got to this one financial issue about how to raise funds for the missionaries. And he, he just kind of went through this phase where he was like, we're not gonna do it that way. And, and, and it got really oppositional between he and I. I. I did a bunch of research. I showed him how other organizations were doing it this way. I showed him you know, like from the scripture why I think that this should work. And the more I provided evidence and, and an argument for this, this new method that we were gonna use, the more he backed into a corner and said, no, Kurt, we're gonna just do it by faith and we're not gonna do that appeal and we're not gonna do that ask. And man, we came to loggerheads and it started to become a real financial crisis, started to really impact families and 
and how they could do their job and how they could pay their bills. And we were coming up to this very, very important board meeting and I was getting more and more frustrated with this guy. I'm like, he doesn't respect us. I don't know what's happened to him. He isn't defending us. He isn't looking out for us. That's his job on the board. He should be the one advocating for us. And then in the middle of all this conflict, my wife asked me this question. Have you prayed about this? Have you asked God to defend you and the missionaries? Have you asked God to change his heart instead of you being the one who's trying to change his heart all the time? I said, of course I have. And then I went into my bedroom and repented and prayed. I literally got on my knees before that board meeting and said, God, I can't do it. In fact, I've made it so much worse. God, would you forgive me? Would you change my heart? And Lord, if it's at all possible, would you change the heart of my friend? Went to that board meeting the next day. Before we even started, before I handed out one thing, this guy said, hey, I want everyone to stop and I want to say something to all of you in front of Kurt. The last few months, I don't know why, but I've, I've gotten real hard-hearted to a few new ideas. And last night in prayer, God spoke to me and he told me to listen and to change my heart. And I want to publicly apologize to Kurt. Well, of course, then I apologized to him and we walked out of that board meeting with a better and stronger idea than either of us had. Are you saying, Kurt, that if I humble myself and I pray that God will change someone else's heart, that it'll work out? That's exactly what I am saying every time. Now, I'm not saying it'll work out exactly the way that it did there. People have free will. People have variables. But I'm saying that if you trust God to be your defender, he'll always defend you better than you can defend yourself. It may not happen in the way I just described it, but I guarantee you, no one is going to get to judgment day and say, God, uh, you should have let me defend myself a little bit more. I would have been doing a better job than you. This is the massive revelation of David. When my enemies pursue me, God pursues them. David stopped defending himself and he let God defend him. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. Who's he talking about here? He's talking about himself. Do you know how much he had to give up? Do you know how disruptive this was to him? And saves those who are crushed in spirit. He's saying that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble, that he himself had learned that when he promoted himself, it went bad, and that when he humbled himself, it went good. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. So he's saying God protects the spirit. That's your emotional health. That's your spiritual health. That's your internal you. And God protects the bones. That's your physical you. That's your tangible needs. God's a better defender of both your heart and your life than you are. Listen to me. Who is defending you? Are you still defending you? It is so exhausting to defend yourself and you're not good at it. You know what Jesus said? Uh, John 14, Jesus gets to the end of his ministry. It's all chaos. It's all conflict. And he looks at the disciples and he says, don't defend yourself. I'm gonna send you the Holy Spirit. The counselor is the word he uses. Now, this word counselor in the Greek is not um, like the psychological counselor. He's not saying, you know, how have you felt about your mother? And, you know, it's not that Freudian thing. You know what the counselor means there? It's defense lawyer. It's like a lawyer counselor. He's saying, I'm gonna send the Holy Spirit so you could be about the job of advancing the kingdom and the Holy Spirit will be about the job of bringing my words to your memory, comforting you in your soul and defending you in this complicated, broken, corrupt world. The Holy Spirit will always do a better job defending you than you will. Don't send that email. Don't get into that argument. Don't stand up for your rights in that caustic way that creates conflict. Let the Holy Spirit do it for you. Who are you fighting with? Stop. Pray. And see that God is close to the brokenhearted, and he protects all your bones. Who will defend me? The Holy Spirit will defend me. That's the question we're asking here. The Holy Spirit will defend me. God will defend me. Okay, number three. First of all, I'll praise publicly and passionately. Number two, I trust God to protect me. Number three theme in this hit of hits. I will pursue both peace 
and I will reject evil. Now that seems kind of obvious, but doing those two together is pretty, pretty difficult. I'm gonna pursue peace, but be about justice and and I'm not gonna let evil compromise anything. I'm gonna go away from drama, but I'm gonna stir up problems when I see people talking evil. He holds these two incredible values in tension because he knows something about the nature of mankind. He knows what Paul taught in Romans that we actually pursue drama and support evil in our nature. We are drama people and we love evil. We're attracted to it. We think evil is awesome. We think everyone else should stop doing evil, but we really find it fascinating and we like it. We like to gossip. We, 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 we like to slander. We like titillating things. And so in our nature, now you say, Kurt, I don't believe that in our nature stuff. That it, listen to me. We say stupid things like, you know, no child is born hating. People that say this have never been around a two-year-old. <laughs> We're, we come out of the womb selfish. Even prominent atheists will tell you, we've got the selfishness gene. Listen, we do teach racism and it gets worse. We do teach that sort of tribalism. We do teach all sorts of bias and hatred stuff and it gets worse and worse, but, but we come out of the womb receptive to that. We come out of the room enti- womb entirely uh, you're not believing me. I'm gonna, have to, I'm gonna have to teach this to you. Um, so around here at Bayside, we do this thing called Breakaway. Thousands of kids, thousands and thousands of kids. Two summers ago, I volunteered to do the Bible teaching for the littlest littles, like the kindergarten, first grade, second grade kids. So I'm in this room. Every morning I'm teaching them. It's packed out. I mean, they're crawling on each other. It's just packed out with these little, little kids. And when we're teaching one day on the concept of forgiveness, we're going over the Bible, scriptures. We're telling them why forgiveness is important, why Jesus forgives you, why you should forgive your mom and dad and your brother and sister. And we're going over it. And we're making them recite verses. And we've got small group leaders helping them all listen. We got great visuals. We got a little skit. I mean, we're teaching forgiveness, 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 forgiveness. And at one point, this gal that's working with me, Carla, she's one on our team, she does something purposefully wrong so that we can ask the kids, should we forgive Carla? So I look at all these boys and girls and said, boys and girls, should we forgive Carla? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Not a single kid says something. Finally, this one little boy in the middle of the room stands up and says, kick her out, kick her out. And all these kids start to chant. It's like some angry mob. I mean, I'm glad we didn't have torches. They would have burned down the church. A thousand kids, kick her out. I'd have quiet them down. Listen, that's who we are in our nature. We're kick her out. We're, well, forgive me, but don't forgive them. We have a difficult time speaking well of people. This is what makes Jesus so radical. Love your enemies. Who's the person that's annoying you the most right now? Love your enemies. Paul says it this way. He says to the first Thessalonians, he says, love more and more and more and love everyone. In that context, in Thessalonica, the everyone was the people that stole money from them, threatened their lives, and, and, and actually the mob was so angry and violent, Paul had to sneak out in the middle of the night. And Paul writes back to them, hey, make sure you love those people. Those people that try to kill us, love them. And that's how Christianity grows. That's how Christianity becomes powerful. That against our nature, we're pursuing peace and rejecting injustice, rejecting evil. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to blot out their names from the earth. It's so true. Here's my question, my final question. Who who are you fighting? Who are you fighting for? Most of us are fighting for ourselves. Some of us are fighting for our families. But most of us are, are fighting for our identity, our rights, our significance, our job, our economic situation, um, our reputation. Most of us spend most of our life fighting for ourselves. And therefore, we give ourselves license in the area of peace and evil. Is that what Jesus did? How did Jesus pursue peace and reject evil? How did he hold those two in tension? Simple. He pursued peace 
by pursuing us. He pursued peace by coming to earth as a man, walking among us, teaching us, washing our feet, and letting himself be crucified on a cross in our place. We're fighting for ourselves so often. Jesus came and fought for you and me. How was it that Jesus pursued peace? He came to end the enmity between us and our Father. The sin that separates us from our Creator, he said, I will come and take the place of that sin. I will pay the injustices, and I am going to solve the problem of evil by dying on the cross in your place. Jesus Christ is the ultimate pursuer of peace. Not in just a way that says, I want everyone to behave, I want everyone to get along, I want everyone to have less drama, but literally coming and saying, I will heal them from the inside out and give them access to their creator by suffering on the cross for them. That's why I praise him passionately and publicly. That's why I seek him. And that's why I want to make my life a life where drama is lowered. Peace is pursued. It's interesting to me here who David does not mention. In this song, there's no mention of Saul. There's no mention of his brothers that minimized them, his dad that ignored him. There's no mention of all of the opposition politically that he went through, of all of the violence that was threatened on his life. No, what David wants to do is not focus on all of the problems and troubles that have come into his life, but the beauty and the glory that God is a God who wants access to David. And that same God wants access to you. That same God wants to come into your life and bring peace and heal you from evil. But he won't force you. He's not a dictator. He invites you. He invites you to surrender your life, to give your life back to him. The life he gave you in the first place. He invites you to hear the music of his love, acceptance, and forgiveness. Can I pray for you? Father God, I thank you for this incredible song of praise and seeking you and a call to live a life like you live, Jesus. I pray that each one that hears it will walk out of here and press into worship passionately and publicly and that each one that hears this message would walk out of here and surrender the defense of themselves and let you defend them. And finally, God, make each and every one of us an agent of peace that rejects evil. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 